Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Salman Saab. I had actually suggested to the organizers that we might all benefit if you go to the other conference and, and you know participate in that. But Happy Mont said that no, we've already invited a lot of people, so we'll stay here. So I'd like to thank uh, the Australia India Institute and the Jinnah Institute, Australia and the India Institute here, and the Jinnah Institute in Islamabad for inviting me uh, to give this talk. Um, I have never been part of the Jafriya uh, dialogue, but uh, because the Jinnah Institute sends out an email and with a lot of photographs in which, which, in which a lot of people are familiar, um, from what I understand, it's an attempt to look at India-Pakistan relations. Uh, unfortunately, or perhaps I hope in the end you'll say fortunately, I will not be looking at India-Pakistan relations. I am going to look at Pakistan specifically and I think that will allow discussion to take place, uh, questions to be asked uh, about India-Pakistan relations based on what I'm going to say. Um, the theme that I'm going to be looking at is simply democracy in Pakistan and whether Pakistan is a democracy or is not. Uh, <clears throat> Pakistan is one of those countries where when you go to sleep, it's a democracy and when you wake up in the morning, you're not sure. Uh, and that's happened quite a few times. That uh, you know, there's always, when, you, when you're going to sleep, you're the last news headline says, okay, the army may intervene, ISPR or somebody other may, may say that. And the next morning, you're, you're wondering what happened, who stopped the intervention. So it's, uh, it's one of those countries where this whole debate about democracy is, has been very unsettled for many decades. Uh, but I'm going to make the argument that um, for until for about 50 years, it was or 60 years, largely there was a sense of unsettled uh, state of play, which uh, changed in 2007 for the better for democracy. If you think democracy is good, for the better, and then in, uh, again in 2014, there's been sort of a, a step back, uh, but and where we are today. So that's what I'm going to um, talk about. It says that I have about 20 minutes, but if I can take 30, uh, that just might allow me to you know, lay the foundations very, uh, sort of, uh, in a historical perspective. Time is all yours. Thank you, sir. You sir. can take an hour. No, 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 that's, that's a bit too much. I don't want to trouble people that much. But, uh, so, uh, so this question of whether Pakistan is a democracy or not, uh, obviously one needs to look back and say, you know, we know that there's nobody asked, asked this question for many decades in Pakistan. When there was a Ziaul Haq or Ayub Khan or Musharraf, that question was not asked. There was no need to ask that question. Uh, anyone in and out of Pakistan knew that Pakistan was not a democracy. The fact that one is asking that question now is actually a very positive sign. And the fact that some have said that, well, it was a democracy and may have slipped a little. But still, that's, I think, uh, a positive trend that's taken place. And I think it's important to underline the fact that while India became a democracy in 1952, um, why Pakistan did not. And I think if one lays that foundation, it helps explain a lot of things. Uh, I actually think that that's the wrong question to ask, and I think India is a spoiler, because just because India became a democracy does not mean everybody else should have. Uh, and as scholars of Indian democracy, Sunil Kilnani, Sudhito Kaviraj, and others have argued, that perhaps Indian democracy came about as an accident, and that's the word that they've used. Uh, and they've explained this accident quite, you know, um, uh, comprehensively. So there is this whole notion of that if India became a democracy, does that mean every other country is supposed to be a democracy as well when they come out of the colonial uh, setup? Yes, and the answer is obviously yeah, yeah. not. And one sees many post colonial countries in West Africa and elsewhere which emerged after uh, independence which didn't become uh, democracies. And of course, Pakistan is no exception to that, but perhaps it took much longer to become a democracy. Also, there's this <coughs> assumption, myth, assertion that Muslims don't like democracy. Uh, that may or may not be true, I, I'm not one to judge. But certainly Arab countries don't like democracy. And I think that's, there's a difference between Muslim countries and Arab countries. And I think one makes, uh, needs to make uh, that claim. Um, and Pakistan is certainly not an Arab country. It's certainly a Muslim country. But uh, I've argued in, in, in recent articles that it's sort of been uprooted from South Asia and been sort of pulled towards the Middle East and has become Arabized a great deal. And I think that's, that has major connotations when we look at the present. And we'll look at that much later. So to begin with, I mean, although I think it's a false question to ask that why did Pakistan not become a democracy, I think the question is why did India become a democracy, which is you know, more interesting in some ways. But 
uh, if you look at the question, why did Pakistan not become a democracy? There are seven or eight very straightforward answers to why Pakistan did not become a democracy and why it took so long. The first is uh, the answer which is always given uh, by Pakistanis when you ask them, and, and now they, and, and there's been a change, they're slightly embarrassed when you ask them, why, why were you not a democracy? Uh, but now there's a sense of embarrassment. Earlier on, about 10 years ago, they said, you know, we don't care. But now there's a sense of uh, embarrassment, which I think is a very positive change, which I'll talk about uh, how things have changed. So the first answer usually is that Mr. Jinnah died, as simple as that. He, he died so Pakistan could not have become a democracy. And, you know, I'm not sure whether there's any truth in that assertion, but there's, that's a very strong conventional view that had Jinnah lived a few years, Pakistan would have been secular, democratic, liberal, and a fabulous place to be in. Uh, it's none of those at the moment, I'm afraid. Um, it, it suffers from serious problems, um, which we could talk about later. But one of the arguments given is that had Jinnah lived, say, for four to five or seven years, perhaps he would have set Pakistan on the track towards democracy. But if you look at uh, Jinnah's own uh, tenure of 11 months uh, as Governor General of Pakistan, uh, there are a number of steps that he took which were autocratic, authoritarian. He dismissed the, the Koro government in Sin, he dismissed the Frontier, Frontier Gandhi, Bacha Khan in, in, in what was NWFP. He went to East Pakistan and said, uh, rather strangely, and he said in English because he didn't know any Urdu, that all of you have to learn Urdu if you have to be Pakistanis. And imagine saying that to the Bengali people. Uh, what could be more insulting? And I think it, it, it sort of sparked the beginning of what happened in 1970 and 71. So one of the arguments given is that, uh, usually made, is that because Jinnah died, Pakistan was not able to set uh, upon a, a, a path of development, of liberalism, of secularism, and democracy. <coughs> and of course, Mr. Jinnah is always contrasted with the other side, Mr. Nehru. And uh, Mr. Nehru lived for 17 years after independence in 1964. And uh, he, without doubt, he stamped India very rather strongly in an image of what was called a Nehruvian idea of India, which many uh, scholars have written about. And democracy was one very strong aspect, one very strong pillar to that Nehruvian idea of India. And although Mr. Gandhi <coughs> died even before Mr. Jinnah died, uh, I think it's very clear that uh, India was gained freedom not just because of Gandhi uh, or Nehru, but there were other people who were very increased very active in the in the freedom movement in India. In Pakistan, it was only Mr. Jinnah, literally the sole spokesman, as Aisha Jalal has called him, and I think rightfully so, that it was Mr. Jinnah who created Pakistan, and not really the Muslim League, not the Aga Khan, not the Akhtari Khan, certainly not the Raja of Mahmudabad, uh, and not you know, nobody else. So there is this, uh, when Mr. Jinnah dies in 1948, September 1948, you see immediately a, a panic situation emerging in Pakistan because there's no leadership. When Mr. Gandhi dies, of course Gandhi had uh, sidestepped a little bit from the politics of the day, but when Mr. Gandhi was assassinated in 1948, in January, you had Nehru, you had Bose, you had um, Ambedkar, you had Patel, you had Azad, you had, a, you had the Indian National Congress basically. And you did not have a similar political establishment in Pakistan. So I think the first argument that's usually given is that Jinnah died and Nehru lived and therefore Pakistan did not get democracy. I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lame argument, but perhaps there's some semblance of truth in that. The second is perhaps more, more interesting and it follows from the, the Jinnah dying argument. Uh, and that is that Pakistan was created by outsiders, from people from the UP, from the, minority, the Muslim minority provinces. UP, perhaps some from uh, Mumbai, perhaps some from Gujarat, certainly Lucknow, Delhi, Aligarh, and that, but not from people from what became Pakistan. I mean, this is a, one of the, the, the problems of Pakistan's existence, that the people who lived in Pakistan were not the people who wanted Pakistan, because they lived in Muslim majority areas, and they did not have the same problems which uh, the Muslims of the UP did. And it was these people who created Pakistan, who migrated, and I've actually argued that these are the people who kabzad Pakistan, the Urdu-speaking Mahajirs, went and took over Pakistan, at least for some years until the Punjabis um, rose in the mid-1960s and so So what's the, the, po the point about not having democracy is largely that the migrants who moved from India to Pakistan did not have any constituency. They had no interest in holding elections because they were outsiders. 
the Koro, the Bacha Khan, the Tivana, the Noons, and the Khan of Kalat and the others who were live, who lived in the place called Pakistan, West Pakistan. They certainly had representation. They at least had a following. They at least had some <coughs> sense of constituency. But other than Mr. Jinnah, there was no. He was the sole spokesman, and there were no. There was no other great leader in Pakistan. So from Yaqut Ali Khan to all the other Nawab Zadars and the others who migrated from the United Provinces, Uttar Pradesh, the United Provinces of colonial India, there were very few who could have stood for and contested in one election. So I think that's another thing that the migrants who came from India to create Pakistan, to establish Pakistan, to take over Pakistan, had already taken it over. And they had no real commitment to democracy. They had no real intention of democracy because they did not have constitu the constituency and they were not known. The third view is, of course, perhaps one would say, we found out what happened, happens to democracy in 1970, when East Pakistan, which had 55% of Pakistan's population, and West Pakistan, which had 45% of population and it was the West Pakistanis who claimed that they created Pakistan not the Bengalis not the East Bengalis not East Pakistan so when uh, had elections been held which were held for eventually in 1970 obviously East Pakistan would have won and of course East Pakistanis or the Bengalis from East Pakistan would have dominated governance and the government of Pakistan and I think the West Pakistanis those who said they gave, made the greatest sacrifices to create Pakistan and I don't think there's any doubt about the extent of sacrifices which millions of people, seven million mi people migrated on one side, seven million people migrated to the, from Pakistan to India. I don't think there's any doubt that the seven million people who migrated from India to Pakistan made a lot of sacrifices. And had they had elections, they would have lost the elections because East Pakistan or Bengal would have won the elections as happened in 1970. So these are the three or four, I think, substantive reasons why uh, in the earlier years, Pakistan did not have democracy. There are a number of others as well which are very important to state and I think it's important to, to, to state what else went wrong in the first few years. I think the first 10 years of Pakistan's independence were very formative and they sort of led uh, to the rise of authoritarian, uh, authoritarianism in Pakistan. The first of course was, uh, I'm not sure how many wars India and Pakistan have uh, fought and I think the answer is four. But if we include the, uh, especially if we include the, the January 1948 Kashmir War, um, in which it was said that Razakars fought the war, as it was said about Kargil, which was a complete lie, um, as we found out much later. But in 1948, the Pakistani army was also involved in this war. And that was the first time it uh, felt that it had a stake in the government of Pakistan, in the establishment of the state of Pakistan. So we see the presence of the what's called the bureaucratic and military alliance in the 1940s and 1950s. And I think it's also important to remember that what is West Pakistan, if you can, let's forget about East Pakistan at the moment, what is West Pakistan was on the peripheries of, British, uh, of, the, of the British Empire, of colonial Britain. Uh, the Bombay, Madras Presidency, the Bombay Presidency, Delhi, UP, Lucknow, I mean, these, Meerut, these were very important strongholds for the, for, the, for the British, except for Lahore and the Punjab. I think Lahore in some ways was the extremities of British control. And after that, of course, you had the Khyber Pass and the Afghan adventures. But in, in Balochistan, which was an area which, was, which is still not visited by Pakistanis, leave alone the colonial empire at that time. Sindh again, because it was part of the Bombay presidency, was in sort of a periphery to British colonialism. So the area which became West Pakistan was largely on the edge of British uh, expansionism, British institutions, British, um, the, the colonial empire. That meant that when Pakistan gained freedom and independence in 1947, uh, it did not have the institutional depth which, say, Uttar Pradesh had or which uh, Central, Central India or the Bombay presidency, probably, probably Presidency or the Madras Presidency, which certainly Bengal had. They did not have the, the administrative structure, they did not have the institutions in place. And as I said earlier, the Muslim League was an alien power which was created in India, in what was United India, and which migrated to what, was, what became Pakistan. So it was the bureaucracy and the military which 
laid the foundations of setting up the administrative structure in setting up houses, jobs, uh, providing rehabilitation to 7 million people who had migrated. A huge task in a state which was tiny and which was completely un under underdeveloped. Unlike the 7 million who moved from different parts of India, most of them I think ended up in Delhi or Punjab in Haryana and Delhi. This is where they ended up. But in, they, they were a very small part of the Indian population. They were a very small part of, uh, of North India. Uh, uh, while these migrants who came from India to Pakistan, uh, they completely overran and, and, and challenged the ability of the administration to provide them housing, food, shelter, and very basic amenities. I mean, forget about anything else. So those are the years when the bureaucracy and the military uh, felt that they were in a better position to, uh, to solve Pakistan's problems. And I think that, that process has continued for many years uh, hence. Uh, another reason why uh, democracy has not existed in Pakistan is that the United States has been very generous whenever a military government has been in power uh, in Pakistan. Uh, it's important to state that the United States does not bring about military governments in Pakistan. I think it's very important. It's not like uh, Iran in 1953. It's not uh, like uh, Central uh, uh, Latin America or Guatemala, where the, the United States has been directly involved in undertaking coups against civilian governments and bringing in military generals. In Pakistan, the fact is that uh, military generals are almost always in power. So the United States has only made better use of generals in power whenever it's needed them. Whether, whether it was the, the Cold War, whether it was the first Afghan war, or whether it's been the most recent, recent Afghan war. Uh, surprisingly, good luck for the Americans, uh, bad luck for Pakistanis, there's always been a military general in power in Pakistan. And the United States has, because of its own goals, whether it was the Cold War, whether it was the, uh, fighting the Mujahideen, uh, fi supporting the Mujahideen, fighting the Soviet Union, or whether it's the war on terror. Uh, the United States has been very lucky that there's been a general because it makes things easier for them. So whenever there's been a military general in power, um, the Americans have been over generous and evidence seems to suggest that far greater US aid flows into Pakistan when the generals are in power. So I think the problem is generals are in power for too long, so you know, US aid is supposed to come at some point or the other, so the, the generals have benefited. And both Ziaul Haq certainly and uh, Musharraf got political longevity on account of what happened in Afghanistan, thanks largely to Saudi and uh, US funding. So the US has played a particular role in, 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 uh, in uh, supporting non-democratic military governments in Pakistan. One can say that they found their own interests and they support their interests, and uh, so you know, I, I, perhaps one can too, allow them some benefit of the doubt there. The judiciary in Pakistan has also been a very proactive supporter of military rule. Every time that there's been a coup, the military, the Supreme Court of Pakistan has endorsed the military coup. It's called the doctrine of necessity. I don't know why this, uh, the, the Supreme Court has always felt that it's necessary to support the military government, but it's continued to do that throughout from the first coup in 1958, Ayub Khan's coup to 1977 to, uh, 2000, uh, to 1999. The, military, the judiciary has played a very important part in giving a constitutional cover, although it's surprising because the constitution is always in abeyance when the military takes over. But the, the Supreme Court gives it gives a sense of a constitutional cover that to, according to the doctrine of necessity, it's important that the military steps in and saves Pakistan from itself. And the military is the only institution which can do so. So the judi judiciary has played an important role in that. Surprisingly, in the past, and I'm only talking about the past, I think, and I'm trying to, I'm, I'm going to make the important point of how things have changed. And I think that's the important point. That's the discussion that we open up. But it's important to lay these, the, the, the groundwork, in order to understand how much has changed. And the change is actually very good. I mean, this might, this is all in some ways ancient history. But I'm not even sure, you know, if, if it's all that ancient. Because there's sometimes there's fears that things might go back to what they were. Civil society also, until recently, used to support military governments. Uh, when Musharraf took over, a large number of very high profile uh, Pakistani civil society actors supported Musharraf's government and they were actually in his cabinet. Uh, members of the Human Rights Commission of Pakistan, of all things, which is supposed to take a very strong democratic stand. In fact, they, they have a uh, session going on uh, in, in the IIC today, some members from, a large number of members from there. But they suddenly <coughs> took aside from the Human Rights Commission of Pakistan and they joined a military dictator. Musharraf was a military dictator, maybe he was a nice guy, but that's irrelevant. 
he was certainly a military dictator. He was an unelected military, military leader. And he was supported by members of civil society, NGOs, who joined his, uh, his cabinet. Umar Razak Khan was one, Shahid Kardar were others. There were others, very well-known people, who occasionally come to India, used to come to India, this Pakistan-India peace uh, development. <coughs> the civil society has also played an important role. And I think it's important to understand why civil society supported military rule in Pakistan, especially in 1999. It was largely at that time when this question of Islamic militarism, militarism, Islamic fundamentalism began to rise. And the assumption was that it's better to support a military dictator who is uh, a liberal in a lifestyle way. Of course, a military dictator can't be liberal in a political way. He can only be liberal in what we call lifestyle liberal. So a lot of civil society actors supported uh, Musharraf because they felt that he would be able to deal with the, milit the militant rising militant threat in Pakistan in the, in the 1999-2000 period. Uh, this is before 9-11 happened and after that a lot of things changed. So that's another reason that one would expect where civil society should play a role <coughs> against military government. You find that civil society plays different roles in different environments. Um, also, the performance of elected representatives in Pakistan uh, Benadir Bhutto and Nawaz Sharif, the previous Nawaz Sharif, and this is, the previous part is very important because I'm going to talk about the new Nawaz Sharif and there's a huge difference. The, the Benadir Bhutto and the previous Nawaz Sharif, the, ro the role that they played in destroying democracy in Pakistan in the 1990s does not uh, become a good advertisement for democracy in Pakistan. Uh, and both realized it as well. I mean, Nawaz Sharif certainly does realize it. I'm not sure to what extent Benadir realized it. We never found out whether she would, what kind of Democrat she would have been. But I think it's also important to state that the performance of, de of civilian governments, I mean, it's almost difficult to call them democratic governments, <coughs> but the performance of civilian governments between 1988 and 1999 uh, does certainly not advertise, uh, is a good advertisement for democracy. The last point I want to make on this historical, this very sort of, uh, sort of short history is that whenever the military has been in power in Pakistan, the economy has done well. I think one cannot uh, ignore this, this fact. But also there, but there are multiple layers to this. I mean, it's, it sounds like a, a, a simple truth. But as we know, truth is multi-layered and you know, truth, there, are, there, are, there are lies and falseness within the truth as well. But if you look at data of economic development or growth under military governments and under civilian governments, you see a huge difference. And Musharraf was very fond of showing that, look, this is what military governments do, this is what civilian governments do, what's the problem, why don't you let us stay on in power, and so on and so forth. So, but there is a lot of empirical evidence which would show that growth rates under military dictatorships have been about six, six and a half, six point eight percent on average. Under civilian governments, <coughs> and uh, they've been 3%, 4%, 3.5%, 4%, you know, and in that range. But I, as I said, I think it's important to unpack that. This is, this is true as far as statistics are concerned, but it's a very simplistic truth. And I think, as we know, once we start unpacking truth, it becomes more complicated. One reason, of course, as I said, is that the U.S. was over generous whenever military governments were in power. Second reason is when Ziaul Haq was in power and Musharraf was in power, there was a war on terror or the, the, the other kind of Afghan war taking place in the region. <coughs> it seemed more, more aid than it ought to have, you know, for, for reasons which the Americans had an interest in. Thirdly, there's certainly a sense of stability. I mean, whatever you say about military governments, there is a sense of stability uh, compared to when politics takes place in a newly uh, democratizing country like Pakistan. I mean, there's a lot of instability, of course, and uh, that's perhaps part of what politics is all about. So military governments, when they do not allow uh, democracy or politics to take place, they're bound to be, this, they're bound to suppress opposition. And that's what Ziaul Haq did far more than what Musharraf did. Um, so they, and another thing is whenever the military takes over in Pakistan, we know it's there for 10 years. So because it's there for 10 years, you know that there's this one window operation. You go to the general, you don't need to go to so many elected representatives and who, who are contesting with each other. I mean, I've been watching the AAP Admi, uh, AAP Party, AAP sort of episode in the last three days, and it just shows you how wonderful democracy is, especially maybe people from Delhi who voted for the AAP Party have different views about it, but under a military dictatorship, one does not see such, such developments taking place, some debate taking place, because the agenda is set, the military is in power, and it sets the agenda. So for 10 years, that's been our past record. The military is going to be in power. It's good for business, and therefore people invest. And uh, as anybody who's been involved in business knows, 
business is not interested in democracy, business is interested in profit. Uh, military government provides stability, it provides greater profits. Uh, elected governments may or may not be good for profit, but certainly military government is, and that's what the Pakistan record shows. So this is, in, in, in a sense, a very short, minute history of what has happened. In 2007, something changed, and I think it's a different narrative altogether, and I think it's important to say that. Um, it's not often <coughs> that anyone would say no to the chief of the army staff who happens to be the president of Pakistan. Uh, on the 8th of March, say on the 9th of March, on the 9th of March, if one went to sleep, or on the 8th of March, let's take the 8th of March, on the 8th of March, if one was going to bed in Pakistan, 8th of March 2009, one was assured that Pakistan is completely under control of Musharraf, and he is the supreme leader of Pakistan. 2007. Sorry? 2007. 2000, sorry, 2007. Exactly, sorry, 2007. When you wake up on the 9th of March, surprisingly one man who endorsed Musharraf's rule in 1999, Iftikhar Mohammad Jodri, stands up and says, no, I'm not leaving. He was asked to leave. He said, I'm not, no, I'm not leaving. It's not very often that you do that to the president of Pakistan, who is also the chief of the army staff. You don't do that to the chief of the army staff. You might do it to the president of Pakistan, but not when they're one person, and not when they're Musharraf, of all people. So you don't say no to Musharraf. So something happened, something changed. Um, Obviously, social change does not take place simply by individuals saying no. Uh, you know, Mandela standing up or Khomeini saying something or uh, Gandhi saying no. Obviously, it has to have social underpinnings as well. Uh, but in 2007, when this happened, uh, we see the beginnings of dissent uh, forming in Pakistan. It started with what's called the lawyers' movement, uh, now very well articulated and very well documented, which was led by former Young Turks in the 1960s and 70s from the People's Party, Etadaz Essen, for example, uh, Munir Malik and others uh, who became very active in the lawyers' movement, all who were lawyers of the Supreme Court, but who were previously political actors. Uh, Etadaz had been in the People's Party, he had been a minister many times, but who became very active. It's important to state that the lawyers' movement was not a movement for democracy. It was a movement for specific vested interests of lawyers. They wanted to reinstate the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in Pakistan. It had what, what social scientists call unintended consequences, that it gave rise to a de democratic spirit in Pakistan. So 2007, sometimes in 2007, things began to change. In 2007, there was also what's called the Lal Masjid episode, when in, I think it was June or July, uh, uh, the, the Lal Masjid in Pakistan was attacked by Pakistan Rangers and Pakistan Army. And one sees Mr. Musharraf, General Musharraf, in some ways losing control of the situation. And I think that, especially when somebody could stand up to him and say no, and you'd have this Lal Masjid operation. And then after that, there was an agreement with Benazir called the National Reconciliation Order, Ordinance Order, the NRO. And there was a sense that there was panic in the ranks of, the, of, of, of those who were running Pakistan's government which was the military. The story of Pakistan's democracy is also the story of Pakistan's military. So, you know, in some ways, when one wants to talk about the history of Pakistan, you can't not talk about the history of the military in politics in Pakistan. It's, it's one of the unfortunate truths which we have to acknowledge. Um, so after 2007, as you are now very familiar, there was a political movement. There was first there was a lawyer's movement, then there was a political movement. And Musharraf was pushed into getting rid of taking off his uniform and becoming a civilian president. And then after that, elections took place in 2007. They were supposed to take place in 2007. They took place in 2008 because of the assassination of uh, uh, Benazir Bhutto. Mr. Zadari becomes president. And before he becomes president, there was a move to, um, what's the word when uh, you want to get rid of a president? Bill Clinton. Impeach. 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 There, was a, there was a move to impeach uh, Musharraf. He was a civilian president at that time. The, um, the, 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 all the five houses, the four provinces, plus the National Assembly and the Senate had to vote on that. And it was very clear that he, they, he was going to be impeached. Before he could be impeached, he resigned. And when he resigned, Mr. Zadari eventually became president and uh, uh, Musharraf went away. So you can see that it's not often that the people of Pakistan have been able to get rid of a military dictator. Fortunately, Ziaullah was died in an airplane crash. Uh, otherwise, he might still have been around. Because I think it's his ghost certainly haunts Pakistan today. Musharraf was forced out by the people of Pakistan, by the democratic process, by the developments that took place, by the people of Pakistan, the People's Party, and both Nawaz Sharif. It's also important to remember in 2008, 
when the elections were held, Nawaz Sharif and the Dari's party were both in government. That has never happened. In throughout, from 1988 to 1999, when Benadir was in power, Nawaz Sharif's only agenda was to get rid of her. When Nawaz Sharif was in power, the only agenda of Benadir was to get rid of him. So they were both pulling each other's legs. That's why I use the word previous Nawaz Sharif. In 2008, Nawaz Sharif and Zardari are very different people from whom, from what they were in the past. And I think it's very important to emphasize the fact that Nawaz Sharif is a very changed, he's a very different man, he's a very different politician. And I think this is his maturity over a period of time having been sent out um, uh, after 1999. So there's been a change. In, in, in fact, so much so that when the military took over in Egypt, Nawaz Sharif stood up and condemned the military takeover of Egypt. That's very surprising for Nawaz Sharif to do that because the Saudis supported the military takeover in Egypt. They were against the Muslim Brotherhood. The Americans supported the, the Muslim Brotherhood being removed from power and the military taking over. But Nawaz Sharif, for some strange reason, said that we support democracy all over the world. I think there is this sense of the fact that demo democracy is very important to Pakistan. Another thing that's happened in after 2007 is uh, up to about 2014, and that's when the story changes a little bit, 2007 to 2014. Uh, the public discourse about democracy has changed. The, what's called the narrative of democracy has changed. Prior to that, people would say, okay, let the, let the army come in. But now, from 2007 onwards, when uh, Zardari took over, and then when the, uh, I know it's, uh, one never says this in India because, you know, it's a, uh, uh, it, 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 the, the fact that it doesn't matter, but it's very central to Pakistan, that for the first time, a civilian government handed over power to another civilian government. After 66 years, in 2013, that's the first time it's ever happened in Pakistan's history, which is, a, I think, a huge symbolic and real step that took place in this process of democratization. Uh, so there's this, this whole discourse in the public sphere, in the media, and elsewhere, of Pakistan being a democracy, and I think for the first time in my lifetime, and I'm not 25 years old, for the first time in my lifetime, I hear people saying that democracy is an option. The government may be doing badly, there are problems with the, with the Zadari government or with that government, but at least democracy is an option which Pakistan needs to think about and perhaps you know take, take, take further. So this, the public discourse has changed, changed a great deal. Also what is important that both Mr. Zadari and Nawaz Sharif came to terms that they are going to defend democracy in Pakistan. So when the Zazdari government was in power, Nawaz Sharif played the role of uh, um, a friendly opposition. That He was accused of that and he, he just didn't care. He, he used to argue that our main interest is to promote democracy in Pakistan. It doesn't matter who's in power, but knowing well that he's going to win, probably win the next elections. Now, once, I mean, it's, this is unheard of in, uh, of in Pakistan's politics, if you look at the previous the previous years. Today, when Mr. Nawaz Sharif needs an ally uh, to defend democracy, his closest ally is uh, Asif Ali Zardari, the pre former president of Pakistan, his opposition. Imran Khan has other problems. I mean, he, Imran Khan has emerged as the main opposition leader in Pakistan, but he has also slowly had to agree to the fact that democracy is an alternative because now I think after the demise of the People's Party, Imran Khan sees himself as uh, the main opposition leader in Pakistan, which I think he is by, uh, by his presence, by his dharnas, by his politics. He's emerged as the main opposition politician in Pakistan. So he also feels that if democracy is allowed to develop and if he can get Khyber Pakhtunkhwa onto a more solid footing and show that this is how one governs one of the most uh, you know, difficult provinces in Pakistan, that he can be a potential candidate for democracy. So I think he's also realized and so it's, it's not exactly true to say that the only game in town in Pakistan is democracy, but one can say that it has moved far forward than it has ever in my lifetime, you know, which, which is many years. So this is the first time that one sees democracy being considered as a major option. Another thing that happened before 2014 was that the military, which has been a hegemon in the politics of Pakistan, was reduced to being a, uh, to having what's called veto power. Its position as a dominant force in the politics of Pakistan was undermined due to a number of events which took place in Pakistan, including Osama bin Laden's uh, the finding Osama bin Laden in uh, in Abbottabad, where the military was actually very embarrassed by the fact that American two American just two helicopters could fly over and, and 
kill Osama bin Laden and you know uh, and everything else that else that happened, mm -hmm. and the military was caught unawares about it, and there was a lot of flack uh, at that time in 2011 when Osama was found and killed, uh, and I think it, I I'm not sure, but I think it's and I'm quite right about this. This is the first time that the chief of the army staff and the DG of the ISI was called to Parliament to please explain what happened there. And you know, it's not very op often that you have the DG ISI and the, uh, the chief of the army staff being asked to report to um, the civilian government. You know what happened over there. In the same month of um, uh, May. 2011, when Osama bin Laden was, I think, killed on the 1st or 2nd of May. Towards the end of May, there was an attack on a base in uh, the Navy base in Karachi called the Mehran base. Uh, and again, there was a lot of discussion at that time that why can't the army, uh, what is the army for? Why is it taking so much of the, the budget of Pakistan? Why it, can, it can't even protect its own people? How is it going to protect the people of Pakistan? So, in this narrative, in, from about 2007 to about 2014, we see the political presence of the army being shifted aside where civilian government, civilian elected representatives started claiming their right to govern Pakistan. The media played a very important role and I think uh, one cannot deny the very powerful role that the media has pay, played. Usually it's been good, lately it's been uh, a bit troubling. But uh, when it played a very positive role, it was very pro-democratic. It used to show live coverage of the Chief Justice's uh, marches, which 24 hours, 36 hours from uh, Lahore, from Islamabad to Lahore, a distance which many of you may have taken by road, which takes four and a half hours, taking 36 hours, shown live on television. So this, this revolution which took place in 2007 through the media continued. And that's why the media became very um, uh, sort of active in its role in sort of promoting democracy in Pakistan <coughs> and sort of questioning the legitimacy of the military uh, to rule Pakistan. So you see, on the one hand, you see a, a greater process of democratization taking place, and then on the second, uh, you see criticism of the military for failing to do its duties. Much of this happened, and this process continued. As I said, 2013 is a watershed. You know, May of 2013, when Mr. Zadari who is still the president of Pakistan, hands over power to uh, Nawaz Sharif, his, op his opponent, and then decides that, okay, on the 6th of September or 5th of September, whenever his term comes to an end, decides to step, step down and Pakistan elects a new president. I mean, this, this process of democratization has not happened. Now, where are we now? What has happened in the last year and a half? And I think this is the question. That, that's why the title of this uh, talk is, Is Pakistan Still a Democracy? Had I been giving this talk uh, up to early 2014, I would have said definitely, and I would have said I would have celebrated that moment that Pakistan is now on the track to be a democracy. But I've been so many, I've been wrong so many times now that I'm, you know, I've I've stopped saying uh, making such statements. In 2014, things changed a little bit. I think uh, the military in Pakistan, which had which had got which had got involved in other issues, uh, for example, this uh, the the Fata operation or the Swat operation uh, earlier, and started dealing with uh, the the war on terror. Uh, for some reason, decided that they wanted their stake back into power. Uh, it started with uh, an as, uh, an assassination attempt on probably the most high profile journalist in Pakistan, Mr. Hamid Mir, whose brother accused the not the ISI, but the DGISI, the head of the ISI, of uh, undertaking that or masterminding that attack. And after that, the military hit back very hard on uh, the media house, which Mr. Hamid Mir belonged to, the Jung Geo Group, which is the largest, which also the Times of India has in Amad Ki Asha, and became, and, and, and there was a forced closed, closed down of uh, the Geo channel for many days. It was not allowed to be shown in many countries, in, in many cities. And they lost a lot of revenue, a lot, a lot of goodwill. So uh, institutions of the military, of individuals in the military, decided that it was time to reinstate themselves as uh, leading power brokers in the, in the context of Pakistan. And we see how the narrative of other media houses also changed. They suddenly became very pro-army, especially some groups you know, became extremely hawkish and very boisterous. All that happened over a period of time, but I think what the turning point in all this is the 16 December attack in Peshawar on the army public school. Uh, and I said this that this is 
had it been a private school, things would have been different. But this is an, uh, the, the school is called an army public school, where many many of the children were uh, had parents who were former military personnel or or, or existing serving military personnel, and this was a direct attack on not just the military but also on the army in response to uh, the attacks which the military has started in the Fatah areas. I think it's there's no doubt about the fact that the military is back in a big way in, the, uh, in, in, in Pakistan. But there's a very big difference, and I think it's important to emphasize that difference. Uh, the military is leading this attack on Islamic militants, the Taliban, whatever you want to call them. And there's no question about that. And I think that perhaps the Nawaz Sharif government has been a bit slow in acknowledging, and Imran Khan actually has done a lot of disservice in saying that we'll open an office in Peshawar for the Taliban. Uh, he said that many times, and we we'll talk to the Taliban, we need to talk to the Taliban. When the military perhaps has been saying, no, we need to go after the Taliban, because now they're hitting back on the military. So the military, without doubt, is leading this war against the Taliban uh, from the 6th of February, uh, 6th of Jan uh, December, very actively. And I think that Nawaz Sharif clearly supports that initiative. And I think most Pakistanis now feel that, you know, enough is enough. Pakistan can't survive if this war on terror continues the way it's been continuing. Uh, there's a difference though. I think there's a difference in where the military lies. I'm, I'm making the point that the military is back on the political, geopolitical uh, map of Pakistan, which it had, from which it had been displaced somewhat prior to 2014, certainly from 2007 to 2013. There's no question about it. The military had lost its presence uh, and its hegemony. But now I think it's made a comeback. But there's a difference. Uh, at least for the moment there's a difference. The difference is that in the past, in the 1960s and 70s, 1980s, uh, when there was a, uh, an electricity breakdown or when there was a problem of water distribution or something, a lot of you people used to say, call in the military, they can solve this problem. Uh, now the difference is that let the military deal with the war on terror and its fallback and the Islamic militants. But the task of bringing electricity is now the task of the civilian government. The task of providing water or petrol or the, all economic crises are now the responsibility of the civilian government. They have to sort it out. So I think what's happened is that from 1947, at least 58, to 2007, when the military ruled for 50 years, there's been a brief period from 2007 to about 2014, when civilian governments, elected civilian governments, have tried to begin a process of democratization in Pakistan, a very slow process. But I think now what's happened is that now there's a bifurcation between where the military stands, which completely leads the war on terror, the war against uh, the militants, and where the civilian government stands. There's been a bifurcation. So in, in, without doubt, the military is back in a big way, but I'm not sure whether that is necessarily as bad as it has been in the past. There's a difference. That's why I say, just as Nawaz Sharif has changed, perhaps the role of the military has also changed in Pakistan. I'll end now with just uh, one or two things that um, a lot of people feel that what, what this new word that they use, the optics or the photo ops, is when Rahil Sharif is met by John Kerry or David Cameron, uh, that certainly sends wrong signals to Democrats in Pakistan. Um, we all know that there's one Sharif who rules Pakistan, but we're not sure which one it is. Thank you very much.